All right, so now that we fit a couple of Tanabe Sagano diagrams, let's look at all of them collectively. So what I want everybody to sort of recognize is that looking at these from, from D1 all the way to D9, you kind of can see that what is shown on these simplified diagrams only, and remember this, is only the spin allowed transitions that are possible. And that's on purpose because these diagrams get incredibly congested um, otherwise. So there's a couple of things that you, you probably immediately notice is in the D1 and D9 cases, so those two, there should only be a single spin allowed electronic transition, which, which sort of makes sense because uh, there's only one electron in each of those configurations that actually you know, should allow you to, or one unpaired electron, which should allow that um, transition to occur. And in all of the other cases, we've already described the D2 case, and then we can go into some other details as, as they emerge. But one thing that's really important to kind of recognize is, is that, remember when you have D4 to D7, this is where you have this line of demarcation present, which again, in all of those cases is differentiating between the high spin and the low spin cases. And that's very relevant for a lot of the, a lot of the you know, sort of spectroscopy you're going to observe from different transition metal compounds because it, it can enable you almost on inspection to visualize whether or not you have a high spin or low spin case. Um, one of them is in a D6 um, configuration. So you're basically going to see one spin allowed transition if you're in a high spin configuration. But in a low spin configuration, you expect to see two. So that's just one simple way of, of kind of differentiating between them. And then you'll see that there's analogies in, in other parts of, of these diagrams as well. Um, the other one to really point out, the special case of D5, which is particularly interesting, is regardless if you have a high spin compound or a low spin compound, there are no um, spin allowed transitions, which is very interesting. But you still can you can still observe very weakly absorbing uh, species because of the fact that you can still relax um, that Laporte selection rule ever so slightly with vibronic coupling, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, but the ideas are all the same here. Um, you know, free ion terms going to ligand field uh, terms and I think you understand sort of the representative examples you've already used are, are really applicable to every one of these diagrams. So let's move on and take a look at the spectra of some, some typical um, compounds here. So the, the ones that are, are immediately interesting is we said in, in D1 and D9, we should only have single transitions, but obviously, you can kind of see that there looks like there's shoulders on those two immediately. Um, we're going to talk specifically about this case in a few minutes here, but, but this is resulting again from Jan Teller distortions. This is in the ground state. This is actually a Jan Teller distortion in the excited state. And recall why if you basically have a transition that started out with a ground state that's T2G1, and then you make an excited state that's EG1, look what happens. You have an unequal occupation of degenerate orbitals, and that sets up an excited state Jan Teller distortion. So um, that, that's kind of the stuff that, that you'll see. We fit this data already, so you sort of now know why there's two observable transitions in the visible, and if you kind of did more of these, you can make the same extrapolation. So like if, if you have chromium D3, the D3 case is here and it looks like there's one, two, three possible spin allowed transitions, regardless of ligand field strength. And you kind of see that's two of them there and that's probably the third one that's highest in energy. So, so that's kind of the way that this works is you can make very good predictions about this. 
Um, here's a D5 example. So you see how weakly colored manganese 2 plus is. And look at how horrific those extinction coefficients are. They're, they're way, way below even 0.1 per molar per centimeter. And all of this like barely observable um, oscillator strength is a result of the fact that there's no spin allowed transitions in a, in a D5 uh, transition metal complex in terms of the D to D transitions. And there's other examples, but the point, the point being there's also some symmetry um, in this. In D8, you see three transitions here. So that's analogous to the D2 case. Um, and then in D7, remember we already said that there's other analogies that you can make. So, so the point being, um, all of the all of these data can be usually fit pretty well to the accompanying accompanying Tanabe-Sagana diagram. So let's talk about copper two and this ground state uh, Jan Teller distortion. So if you remember, we already said that copper two plus on um, the hexa-agua complex already has the weird situation where um, you basically know um, that you get elongation along the z-axis. And then if you just think about in terms of crystal field theory, what that means, it means anything lying along the z-axis becomes stabilized. And therefore, you're no longer octahedral because if you're stretching the bonds in the z direction, um, you've now changed the ligand field and you've changed the point group. So it drops effectively from, from octahedral down to uh, D4H, and I'll show that on the next slide, but you can see here there's an unequal occupation of degenerate orbitals, and that's the situation that, you know, the Jan Teller distortion likes to, uh, likes to go, and, you know, some of the details are, are here, but basically they always distort to lower their energy, and this always happens when you have these degenerate orbital sets that are partially filled and and then partially occupied EGs lead to more pronounced distortions than partially occupied T2G orbitals. And the most common distortions to trigonal, but you can you can get trigonal distortions as well. Um, so you can kind of see there's two bands here. So let's go back to this here. And it can be rationalized, in fact, by assuming that you stretch the bonds and stretching the bonds puts you in a slightly different point group and that turns on now two possible low energy um, D to D transitions and, and that is what gives rise to those two apparent bands that you see in the copper two um, D to D transition, which is giving it its characteristic blue color. Um, so I don't want to harp on this too too long, and I, I'll give you a couple other details about electronic spectroscopy and transition metal compounds. So obviously in tetrahedral compounds, remember how this works now. Tetrahedral, you have an inversion center, you have the RADA um, labels and the Molkin symbols because of the fact that you have an inversion center in the molecule. In a tetrahedral point group, that goes away. So now you see what happens. There's no garotas and ungaratas anymore. So that means the Laporte selection rule does not apply to tetrahedral compounds. So tetrahedral compounds have more intense absorptions in the D to D transitions with respect to octahedral compounds. And there's another caveat to this. See how we have a D1OH um, configuration on the left and on the right, we have a D9 tetrahedral configuration. So what happens is, is that we also know something else, is that if this is, if that's del O, we know that that splitting is about 4 9 uh, del O, partially because there's four ligands with respect to six. Um, but let's think about what this means in terms of the electronic spectroscopy. So since the splitting of the D orbitals, is actually opposite between tetrahedral and octahedral, meaning their effectively symmetry labels are flipped over. Um, tetrahedral configurations with n empty orbitals, an empty orbital or an orbital lacking an electron is also called the hole. So a hole is a vacancy, much like shown right here. That's the that's the vacancy in the T2G in the T2 orbital set. And 
those occupied or that that like single hole basically means that it has the same symmetry as the the dn octahedral configuration so basically d9 and tetrahedral um, is exactly the same tanabe sagano diagram as d1 and octahedral and then you can kind of see where this goes d8 nope let me do that again d8 and tetrahedral correlates to d2 and octahedral and then you can kind of see what's happening seven would go to three um you know and six goes to the d4 and so on and so forth so basically you can use the octahedral d 10 minus n tanabe sagano diagram to describe the the dn tetrahedral complexes so that's another exercise that's sort of very common is just using the tetrahedral um or using the tanabe sagano diagrams for an octahedral uh molecule you can do it for the corresponding um, tetrahedral molecule with n number of holes.